So thank you all for coming. Um, I actually chose this topic because <laughs> in the beginning of uh, this year as fellows um, in clinic, I had a patient that was termed this long-term non-progressor, actually came in and his CD4 count was fine, his viral load was fine, and he was on like no antiretroviral therapy. So I'm like, what are you doing here? <laughs> I'm like, who are you? Why are you here? <laughs> what, what am I going to do for you? And he um, was categorized under these, both of these titles. And so it, it was always in the back of my mind that I need to look this up. <laughs> so this kind of forced me to. And then um, in choosing the topic, uh, Dr. Ehler said, What's, you have to pick something that's hot and happening in ID. So I figured I would um, talk a little bit about the Mississippi baby and the Berlin patients a little bit more. Um, so that's my topic. Okay. So a little bit of background. Um, HIV AIDS continues to be one of the most significant infectious diseases globally. It's, res it's responsible for more than 22 million deaths worldwide since the 1980s. And nearly 70 million persons have acquired HIV since the epidemic was recognized. At the end of 2009, um, an estimated 1.1 million persons aged 13 and older were living with HIV in the United States, including 207,000 persons whose infections had not been diagnosed. So just a little epidemiology to review. We know with HIV results in progressive immune deficiency with the loss of CD4 cells um, and cellular immunity and increase in plasma vir viremia, which eventually results in the development of AIDS. Um, typically, AIDS develops within 8 to 10 years after initial HIV infection in p persons that do not receive therapy. And disease rates actually vary among HIV-infected individuals between rapid or slow disease progression. And as we know, antiretroviral therapies help delay or prevent progression to AIDS. And if stopped, a rebound in virus production occurs with, and resistant to, resistance to ART can emerge. So just to go back, because I'm going to use a lot of these terms, and this part's a little dry, but you just need to familiarize yourself with these terms because I'm going to use them a lot later. So basically, um, Viral, viral replication results in cellular and humoral immune responses. Um, the cellular immune response bas basically does not involve antibodies. It involves activation of phagocytes and natural killer cells, which help destroy pathogens. And more specifically, it act, um, activates antigen-specific cytotoxic CD8 T lymphocytes, um, which induce apoptosis of virus-infected cells. The cellular immune response also stimulates the cells to release cytokines. In humoral immunity, um, that refers to antibody production. Mainly, CD4 T helper cells become activated and then in turn activate cytotoxic CD8 T cells. Um, B cells recognize antigens, which then activates the production of antibodies. So basically, in this entire slide, just know cellular immunity involves cytotoxic CD8 cells, and then humoral immunity, you have antigen um, activating CD4, which then it activates CD8. Okay? Then, um, in your little handout, I'm just the pictures are a little bit bigger, so you can also take a look when I'm talking. Um, this basically shows that uh, antigens associate with an MHC molecule, um, which then the T cell recognizes that combination. So cytotoxic CD8 T cells on the left um, destroys virally infected cells. They recognize the antigen that's presented by MHC class 1 molecules. So just remember 1 and 8. And then CD4 T helper cells become activated after recognizing antigens presented by an antigen presenting cell via the MHC class 2 molecule. So I just remembered like 2 and 4, CD4, and then MHC class 1 and 8. So like 2 times 4 is 8. So 2 and 4, and then 1 and 8. Okay. I'm going to talk about that a little bit more detail later. So just to review, it's important to understand the structure and, and genome organization of HIV in order to grasp the pathogenesis. So I'm going to review a little bit about that because, again, I'm going to use the terms later. Um, the outer coat of the virus is the viral envelope. Embedded throughout the envelope are proteins from the host cell and multiple copies of the complex HIV um, ENV protein. The HIV ENV protein is made up of three molecules of glycoprotein 120 and a stem consistent of three molecules of GP41. 
Um, there's a lot of research to develop a vaccine to prevent HIV infection and which is focused on these envelope proteins. Within the envelope is a capsid made up of 2,000 copies of the viral protein P24. The capsid surrounds two single strands of HIV RNA, each of which has a copy of the virus's genes. Um, three enzymes important to the virus's life cycle are also, are also located within the capsid, as we know, reverse transcriptase, integrase, and protease. So this is the HIV RNA genome. Um, there are three structural genes, the GAG, PAL, and ENV genes. And those contain information needed to make structural proteins. Um, the HIV has six regulatory genes listed there. And they contain information to produce proteins that control the ability of HIV to infect a cell, produce new copies, and, and then cause disease. Um, so for example, the NEF protein um, helps the virus to replicate efficiently. We'll talk about that later. Um, the VPU encoded protein influences the release of new virus particles from infected cells. So again, just terms you need to familiarize yourself. So um, CD4 cells, as we know, are the main target for HIV. And entry of HIV into the host cell requires the binding of one or more GP120 molecules on the virus to CD4 molecules on the host cell surface. Binding to a second receptor is also required, the, either the CCR5 or CXCR4, as you can see in your picture in your handout. A little bit closer. The R5 HIV types bind to the CCR5 and X4 HIV types bind to CXCR4. Then the virus enters the cell. Um, once you have fusion of the HIV cell to the host cell surface, um, HIV RNA, reverse transcriptase, integrase, and other viral proteins enter the host cell. Then viral DNA is formed by reverse transcription. The viral DNA is transported across the nucleus and integrates into the host DNA. And the new viral RNA is used as a genomic RNA to make viral proteins. The new viral RNA and proteins move to the cell surface and a new immature HIV virus forms. Then the virus matures by protease releasing um, individual HIV proteins. We're almost through this part. And then we'll get to the good stuff. So, um, so after the virus enters the body, there's a period of rapid viral replication, um, resulting in high levels of HIV RNA and the HIV P24 protein. Um, as we know, the window period is between the time of an infection to the point at which evidence of infection is detected, usually around 22 days. So that's why you have um, possibly false negatives when you screen for HIV. Um, you have a, uh, in the green line, you have the marked drop in CD4 cells in the acute phase, and then a rising HIV viral load but seen by the red line. Um, you also have the activation of the cytotoxic CD8 T cells, um, the blue line, which then kills the HIV infected cells. Um, ultimately, you have an increase in anti HIV antibody production, which is um, the result in zero conversion. Um, the loss of CD4 cells occurs most acutely, um, mostly during the acute stage, during the first weeks of infection. And um, as we know, the cytotoxic T lymphocytes are important for controlling the virus, uh, which peak and then decline as the CD4 count rebounds. Um, a good cytotoxic T lymphocyte response, CTL response, um, has been linked to slower disease progression and better prognosis. Okay. so. Onto the definitions, also in your handout. So after the initial discovery of HIV um, as the cause of AIDS, uh, there was a small group of untreated HIV-infected patients um, that were identified who didn't show any progression towards AIDS. Um, they were termed long-term non-progressors. And they, these long-term non-progressors actually make up less than 5% of the total HIV population. Uh, they maintain a high CD4 count, and they are usually above 500 for many years without any antiretroviral therapy. They have no symptoms of HIV disease, usually around between 10 to 20 years, which has been documented. And the viral load ranges anywhere from 50 to 50, 15,000 copies. They have had no prior history of antiretroviral therapy. So then, as viral load testing became available around the 1990s, long-term non-progressors were further subdivided into a subgroup that showed that the HIV RNA plasma viral load levels were persistently below 50 copies. And those subgroup 
um, were called elite controllers. So elite controllers represent about 1% um, of the HIV population, so around 1 in 300. And an av um, average studies have shown that this patient population to be infected with HIV, they, they can be elite controllers for over 20 years. They have a normal CD4 count, and again, the viral load is undetectable. So that's the main difference between a long-term non-progressor and an elite controller. Um, later on, we, when we uh, looked at a lot of papers, the definitions for these were all over the place because um, there was no strict definition. And the, in terms of follow-up, they would study these patients for maybe five years or ten years. So then how, how can you define whether or not an elite controllers for over 20 years, or maybe it's longer than that, or maybe they um, actually progress to AIDS earlier than that. So it kind of varies. But overall, these definitions were consistently used throughout. <coughs> so why should we understand these people, <laughs> these populations? It's actually, a, a, what? They not not only because they show up in your clinic, and you're like, what do I do with you? Um, you're not any meds. But actually, a lot of research and um, vaccine strategies have used these patient populations and their, and studied their mechanisms of um, protection against AIDS and progression um, to viral replication, etc. So um, again, studies have shown that these long-term non-progressors can actually progress. So they they looked at why why did these people progress. Um, elite controllers are extremely rare and less likely to progress. However, they also may eventually lose control. So um, in order to, we have to understand these groups, but then also help better define them later on for these studies. So there are a number of factors that act to prevent progression, and I'm going to talk about these in detail based on the the um, articles that I found that kind of group things together. Um, there, it can be divided into host genetic factors, host immune response factors, and then viral factors um, that can be are the reasons for the mechanisms of why they're non-progressors or elite controllers. And we'll talk about that in detail. So the host genetic factors have been associated with vir viral control and long-term non-progressors. Um, as a review. HLA genes encode MHC proteins, which are on the surface of all cells. And the HLA genes are divided into class 1, 2, and 3. Um, and then the class 1 is further subdivided into A, B, and C. So HLAs that correspond to MHC class 1 present antigens to which cells? CD4 or CD8? 1, 8, right. And then HLAs that correspond to MHC class 2 present antigens to the CD4 T helper cells and stimulate antibody production. Studies have shown that there were strong associations between viral control and specific HLA class 1 and 2 alleles. HLA B27 and B57 alleles were consistently overrepresented in individuals who showed viral control um, in, without any antiretroviral therapy. And actually, there were um, papers that showed that HLA B57 patients had an average of 0.92 log lower viral loads. There are also um, polymorphisms in co-receptors and chemokines, and the co-receptors that I talked about, um, the CCR5 and CXCR4, are also important genetic factors associated with protection in these long-term non-progressors and elite controllers. So the polymorphisms that I'm talking about are that CCR5 delta 32 polymorphism. So we know that CCR5 is normally expressed at higher levels in activated CD4 T cells. And then, like in the picture in the handout, HIV uses CCR5 co-receptor for entry into the cells. So there are a lot of studies that showed that these non-progressors carried a mutation called the CCR5 delta 32 polymorphism, which essentially reduced CCR5 expression. Individuals who were homozygous for this deletion were resistant to R5 HIV um, 1 infection, and heterozygosity for the CCR5 mutation actually resulted in re just a reduced expression of the CCR5. So interestingly, about 1% of Caucasians are homozygous, and 9 to 20% are heterozygous 
for the polymorphism. And the polymorphism is actually nearly absent in native uh, Africans, East Asians, and American Indians. Um, Long-term non-progressors are frequently heterozygous. Um, so another po polymorphism I listed there um, is the CCR2641 polymorphism. You won't remember, but basically it reduces the CXCR4 expression. So just kind of remember CCR5, delta 32, and the CXCR4. So um, other host factors that sh allow for protection in these groups um, are the host immune factors. And like we talked about before, the C the cytotoxic CTL response. Um, majority of studies have shown that a robust HIV-specific immune response may be responsible for maintaining this long-term control um, of HIV replication in the controllers and non long-term non-progressors. There was a, a study with a homosexual male. He was defined as an elite controller, and he maintained viral loads less than 50 copies, high CD4 counts for over 20 years. He, he developed a super infection, which essentially he was exposed to another um, strain of virus. So before he was an elite controller, and then he was exposed. And he actually lacked any, no HLA class 1 or HLA class 2 alleles. He showed control of the two viruses with low viral loads, um, basically due to an effective CTL response, because he had no HLA1 or 2 alleles. Um, CD8, CTL response to specific um, genes, like the proteins e, ENV, GAG, and PAL, represent one of the most effective mechanisms to control HIV infection. GAG-specific CD8 T cells are um, associated with a lower viral load and promoting long-term control. There are also um, ligands, chemokine ligands, that may act as competitive inhibitors to the HIV-1 um, co-receptors, and those are the names of them. Um, and then there's also studies about um, humoral immunity being a factor, um, where neutralizing antibodies uh, may account for the ability to control virus, but actually that wasn't proven, and they kind of said that was less likely the reason. So again, more likely the host genetic factors and the host immune factors are the mechanisms of control. Um, uh, there's a study that showed that patients, um, there were higher titers of HIV-specific antibodies and progressors, more so than elite controllers and long-term non-progressors. So HIV-positive patients that eventually um, developed AIDS actually had higher antibodies. So the humoral immunity was, not, again, not a factor. So the viral factors I was talking about um, are, they describe mutations or deletions in these structural or non-structural genes as the mechanism for um, control of viral replication. Um, sorry. Um, as you know, these viral accessory proteins, they play an essential role in, the, in replication. The NEF protein has been classically associated with progression to disease. Um, several studies showed that HIV-1 NEF mutations were found in long-term non-progressors. Um, the NEF proteins were defective and less capable of enhancing viral replication and infectivity. And in, two in 2013, there was um, a study that showed for the first time an elite controller patient which had NEF-deleted viruses. So overall, um, the mechanisms of these non-progressors and elite controllers, the majority of research showed that highly active immune responses and genetic modes of control are the main mechanisms, more so than the viral factors, the mutations, or the deletions. Um, some elite controllers showed no evidence of viral mutations, and the mutations in the NEF and, v and VPR may cause viral attenuation in some non-progressors, and these mutations are actually not frequently present. So, um, again, the non-progressors may become progressors, and these elite controllers may actually lose control. Um, Long-term non-progressors still maintain some low level of viremia. Uh, the majority of the non-progressors and elite controllers have normal CD4 counts, but they can become immunodeficient with CD4 depletion. Um, 
previous analysis showed that HIV-infected patients who were exposed to a second virus, the superinfection, were generally associated with a loss of viral control and a drop in CD4 count. There were two elite controllers that suffered accelerated rates of disease progression after documented superinfection. Um, there was a paper done in January of this year which looked at the um, cascade data, which is from the concerted action of zero on zero conversion to AIDS and death in Europe. And it pooled um, data from 2011 with 28 cohorts from Europe, Canada, Australia, and Sub-Saharan Africa. And they, they studied a total of 25, over 25,000 HIV positive patients. And they basically looked at um, various definitions um, and tried to come up with the best def def definitions for the controllers and long-term non-progressors. And in that study, they showed um, that 7% of controllers actually progressed to AIDS. So it was a pretty good study. Um, so I just wanted to touch a little bit ab about um, vaccines and um, the different vaccine trials that were going on because I came across those in, in my research. Um, the STEP vaccine study um, started in 2005 and ended in 2007. Um, candidates were high-risk men and women who were HIV um, negative. They were given three vaccinations of adenovirus synthetically modified to contain the GAG, Paul, and NEF proteins. <clears throat> the idea was to induce this cell-mediated immune response to the adenovirus and to reduce infection and the viral set point. However, 24 cases of HIV infection among 741 volunteers who received at least one vaccine or one dose of the vaccine um, compared to the uh, around 21 cases in the placebo group actually had higher risk of developing infection. So the people that got the vaccine um, were still not relatively protected from the placebo when compared to the placebo group. So they stopped that <laughs> vaccine trial in 2007 um, due to the preliminary data and safety concerns. Then there was another um, trial, the HVTN, which was from 2009 to 2013. And they looked at this DNA boost vaccine um, to reduce viral load in, in individuals who later became infected with HIV. And that was stopped because there's just poor data. Um, and I th think this is going on right now, this RV144 trial, and which was um, basically they have over 16,000 volunteers. That's all I have for that. Okay. Um, overall, they said in terms of vaccine strategies, um, they should focus on uh, partial immune control against the viral replication, so the immune response, while to prevent clinical disease, rather than developing a vaccine to prevent virus infection. Um, majority of the evidence strongly um, favored the role of the CTL response in control of viral rep replication. So. Um, an ideal vaccine would be to use a combination of the immunologic responses, like the T-cell response, with um, a wide range of coverage of the HIV-1 epitopes. Also, gene therapy is being looked at um, to control, uh, as administered as antiretroviral therapy to control a infection in HIV-positive patients. Um, one example was a genetically engineered CD4 cell that were resistant to HIV-1 infection by suppressed co-receptor expression. And that would possibly be transferred to the recipients. Um, another example was transfer of T-cell receptor genes from a T-cell specific for HLA B57, um, which would generate highly specific T-cell responses to reduce viral load early in infection. Um, a lot of the papers stated that um, future research should be should determine if minimizing activation of the vector-specific CCR5 CD4 T cells is possible. So um, that's that. OK, now we're going to talk about the baby, which is not necessarily relevant to these non-progressors and controllers, but I thought this patient was interesting. And it's hot and happening, right? OK. So. <clears throat> Just to review the um, recommendations, um, during active labor in 
aren't naive pregnant women. Um, it's recommended to give zidovudine, um, two mg per keg IV over one hour, and then a continuous infusion of one mg per keg per hour from the onset of labor to delivery. Um, this is from the AIDS info NIH, um, and uh, this the baby was essentially the second box because um, he was born prior to 35 weeks. Um, in the second half of this table, it uh, showed this additional antiretroviral prophylaxis is recommended um, for infants whose mothers did not receive any um, antipartum antiretroviral therapy. So we recommended giving nivirapine three doses in the first week of life. So just so we learn a little bit more about this baby. So this paper came out in the New England Journal of Medicine in, in October. And basically, this infant um, was born by spontaneous vaginal delivery at 35 weeks to a woman who did not receive any prenatal care. Um, rapid HIV screen of the mother became positive, and the baby was actually delivered before the zidovudine was, could even be started. So at 30 hours of the infant's age, he, um, the baby received zidovudine, lamivudine, and nevirapine. Okay? I don't know if you can see that table. Um, so basically at 30 hours, um, the HIV DNA in the peripheral blood of the infant was, di was positive. And in the infant, the viral load was around um, over 19,000 copies in, at 31 hours of age. It's in the table. At one week, um, the baby's regiment was actually switched. Um, the nevirapine was switched out to ritonavir boosted lopinavir. And that was actually against FDA recommendations because it's not recommended to give the boosted regimen to infants younger than 14 days of age. At day number 29, the, the baby's viral load became undetectable. The uh, infant was not breastfed within the first year of life, and actually the mother discontinued antiretroviral therapy at around 18 months, so she reported. But then um, pharmacy looked back, and in the records, she didn't fill a couple scripts, so they thought that she actually stopped therapy at around 15 months. At 24 months of age, um, the viral load still was undetectable. The HIV PCR test was actually negative, and the antibody test was negative. And the CD4 T cell remained elevated, as you can see in that chart. So going back to that table again. Interestingly, neither the mother nor the infant had these HLA class 1 or 2 alleles. Um, and so there's no association with HLA B27 or HLA B57. And they both had no mutations for CCR5. Um, the viral RNA uh, was detected at a single copy level in plasma obtained at 24 months, but not at 26 months. Um, antibodies were not detected in, in the baby at 24, 26, and 28 months of age. Um, there were some, this like 22 million uh, resting CD4 T cells at 24 months, um, but those actually didn't yield any replication competent HIV-1. So the baby had, again, a negative repeat HIV-1 PCR, negative um, HIV-1 antibodies, undetectable viral load, and a sustained CD4 response. And so given that the patient had no rebound viremia and, and no more cell-associated HIV-1 DNA, um, it was without any antiretroviral therapy, this suggested that replication competent HIV-1 reservoirs may not have been established or were markedly um, el maybe eliminated from this patient. In other papers that studied um, infants receiving antiretroviral therapy, um, this case is different because the proviral HIV-1 DNA and plasma HIV-1 RNA were only intermittently detected at levels like right above um, the assays that were positive, but otherwise essentially like negative. 
Um, early antiretroviral therapy may inter interfere with the quantities or qualities of persistent reservoirs of replication competent virus. So that's our baby. That was in October. We're almost done. So there's actually two Berlin patients. Did you guys know that? Not you. <laughs> okay. Um, so the first one was in 1999. Um, this is more pertinent to what I was talking about before. This was a German in his mid-20s. He was diagnosed with HIV in 1996. Um, and he was... Uh, immediately started on this combination therapy with didanosine, indinavir, and hydroxyurea. His viral load at that time was around 80,000 copies. Um, the hydroxyurea was thought was proposed to be more of an immunomodulator to inhibit T cell activation and reduce the pool of target cells. Um, and then. There was a follow-up paper in the New England Journal of Medicine that came out in February um, that looked back at this patient. And basically, he had um, continued suppression of viral replication with no antiretroviral therapy for about 15 years. Um, in this graph, basically the mean viral load remained around 2,000. Um, there's one little blip here, uh, the little spike. Um, and but the mean CD4 count remained around 729. So they looked at they did a genotypic analysis of this patient, and he did show this HLA class one um, HLA B57 allele. Um, hit greater than 50 percent of the HIV specific CTL responses were directed against the NEF epitope, and um, they thought that basically his control of the virus was secondary to his genetic background. So that's the patient. Then the second patient, Timothy Ray Brown. He's not anonymous. Um, <laughs> he This initial study came out in 2008. So he, this was a 40-year-old male that was diagnosed with HIV in 1995. He was started on a tripla. Um, and then in 2007, he was diagnosed with AML. At the time, um, his CD4 count was 415, and the viral load was undetectable. In terms of his AML, I don't know if you can see that, um, he underwent two courses of induction chemo and one course of consolidation chemo. His antiretroviral therapy was stopped during the first induction chemo, secondary to renal and liver failure. He had a rebound in his viral load, around 6 million copies, and then his heart was restarted. Then his viral load became undetectable. He had relapsed AML, um, and then he underwent an uh, allo stem cell transplant. He, he, the patient, Tim, was heterozygous for the CCR5 Delta 32 allele. The donor was HLA matched and was homozygous for the CCR5 Delta 32 allele. Heart was stopped one day prior to that transplant. He engrafted at day 13, and at one year follow-up, um, he, he was doing relatively well with no infections. He only had like grade one um, GVHD. He unfortunately suffered a second relapse at 30, 332 days after the first transplant. He underwent reinduction chemo and a second transplant on day number three, 391 from the same donor. At 20 months, he achieved complete remission, and to date, he has no active replicating HIV. That's that's actually him, I think. Yeah. So um, Tim's peripheral cells changed from heterozygous to hom the homozygous genotype. Um, it showed that homozygosity for the 32 base pair deletion in the CCR5 allele provides high but not complete resistant to HIV-1. Um, this, they thought that this may have been due to the um, other co-receptors, the CXCR4, um, and that there could be a switch in the use of the co-receptor during the course of infection. In Tim, the X4 variants were actually detected prior to transplant, so you had that. 
Um, but uh, interestingly, after um, the transplant, the X4 variants were in these other reservoirs, but were too low in number, um, and to and they didn't recede in his replaced immune system. I'm sorry to allow receding of his replaced immune system. So um, at day number 159 after transplant, this is interesting. They did a rectal biopsy, which showed the CCR5 um, expressing macrophages in the intestinal mucosa, not replaced by the immune the new immune system yet. Um, they thought that these cells from the host uh, could be long-lasting reservoirs even after transplant. However, the HIV-1 DNA was not detected in the rectal mucosa. Even though the CCR5 macrofa expressing macrophages was there, actual HIV-1 DNA was not detected. It was not in the mucosa, and it was not in the peripheral blood or bone marrow. Um, he still had antibodies against um, HIV envelope antigens. Um, they were detectable, but they were at decreasing levels. So that's our Berlin patient. So take home points. The mechanisms still remain unclear, but overall um, host genetic factors and immune responses are likely the driving mechanisms. <clears throat> um, more specifically, the HLA B27 and B57 alleles, polymorphisms in core receptors, especially um, patients that are homozygous for this uh, mutation, CCR5 delta 32, and then also uh, the C CTL response to specific um, genes. Um, vaccine trials should focus on partial immune control against viral, viral replication um, to prevent clinical disease rather than focusing on preventing virus infection. And then just a couple more slides. This is actually, if you have an elite controller, a long-term non-progressor, this is the website and how to, there's like numbers you can call to, ref, to give to the patient in case they're interested in um, enrolling in this. And I think they just have to get their blood drawn like twice a year. There may be some compensation. <laughs> um, and the number is at the bottom. <laughs> and that's it. And our references. or discussion <laughs> amongst. It's a really difficult topic, but <laughs> the, just the main take-home points were the last slide, just to familiarize yourself with the terms.